Hey, welcome everyone. So today we are going to talk about Kusala and Akusala Kama. And before we start, let's pay respect by reciting Namo Tassa three times together. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambutasa. Okay. Now, last week, we have finished all the Kamawachara chitas, the chitas with characteristics of the central plains. And today we are going into a little bit more details before we move to uh, Rupa Wachara Chitas, which, which are the Chitas with characteristic of the um, fine material plane. So before we move there, we would like to uh, look a little bit more about this unwholesome and wholesome consciousness. So under Kamawachara Chitas, we see that we have seen uh, Loba Mula Chita, um, consciousness rooted in greed, Consciousness rooted in dosa, aversion, and consciousness rooted in delusion. And on the other hand, we have also wholesome consciousness, which have always universal two good roots, aloba, non-greed, and dosa, non-aversion, and sometimes with wisdom as well. Sometimes occasional, no? With wisdom or without wisdom. So these are those um, wholesome consciousness and unwholesome consciousness, which we have already looked at uh, last week. Now, when does this Akusala or Kusala Chitta arise? Today, we are going to talk a little bit more um, in practical terms. When and how does this uh, Chittas arise in us? Okay, previously, we have talked about that uh, we have three kinds of actions, right? So actions is also karma, no? So when we do physical action, verbal action, and mental action, while we are performing these actions, then um, chittas always arise in the mind, yes? So if we do good actions that kusala chittas arise, if our actions is unwholesome, then our kusala chittas arise. So now today we are going to look at practically what are considered unwholesome and wholesome actions, okay? Now, our kusala first, we are going to look at our kusala first. The, um, when we introduce the Akusala Chittas, we have seen that those uh, actions or those um, mind are those when we perform actions that lead us more and more to uh, lead, uh, drag us downwards, lead, lead us to more defilements, more greed, more aversion, and more delusion. Those are those Akusala Chittas, no? So in terms of actions, there, in the Avidamata Sangaha, it introduced 10 course of unwholesome actions. So these unwholesome actions are divided into three kinds. The first one is um, physical. Then we have verbal and we have mental, no? Then these three types of actions, which in each group we have further, we have fur it, it is further divided into three physical unwholesome actions, four verbal and three mental. So first of all, let's look at the Three physical unwholesome actions. What are they? Now, the first one is called Panati Pata, killing living beings. This we are quite familiar because in the precepts that uh, we already know about this. So this first one, any kind of living being, not just only human beings. No, So any kind of living beings, uh, the taking the life of these living beings are considered as panatipata. And then actually this panatipata, this word is uh, very beautiful because it is actually not really just killing, but actually it, it means that to cut short the lifespan of a living being. So the wisdom is already there. You see, like living being is bound to, pass away, is bound to die one day, you know, but if a person um, uh, intentionally cut short the lifespan of another being, that is the meaning of actually panati pata. So killing living being is the first unwholesome action. And then we have adinadana, 
taking what is not being given, uh, stealing. And this stealing is also, it has a wider range, not just only like these pictures we see like picking pockets or stealing things in the shop, but taking what is not being given. Then sometimes there are things that are there that uh, we think that well, maybe we can take it or, or like just like this picture, but actually this is not being given. But sometimes people take what is not being given. This is also considered adinadana. Or sometimes when we go to the market and then there are some pinaks and some things and maybe uh, we can try or, you know, take something. Then this actually, it is simple things. If it is not being offered, then it is also in a way adinadana. So in a simple way, then actually these things can easily be solved. Like, for example, if we go to the market, and uh, we can just simply tell the shopkeeper, like, can I try these pinaks before buying? I just want to taste how it how it is or something. No, then usually if they would say yes, no, if they say yes, then this is not taking what is not being given because it is offered already. So um, the, with these simple things, we can avoid this akusala of arising. No, so uh, taking not it what not what is not being given is the second one. Then we have a uh, kamesubi chachara. The sexual misconduct. Uh, yes, Claudia. But uh, when you ask uh, the um, the person to let you try, mm -hmm. is not to develop any um, craving toward the the good because you want that that specific things, no? Um, I think it depends on on the person or and on the situation. For example, if I want to buy something and I want to see how if, if it is what I want first, then if I asked if they let me try, then I think it's okay because I want to buy. It's not that I asked her to give me something without I don't want to buy her anything, right? So I think that's acceptable and not not because I'm greedy, just because I want to see if that is what I want. And then if if I just ask uh, because I wanted to take a little bit and if the person said it's okay, then it's okay. It might be loba mulachita, right? It may be, but it depends on the person. What is the motivation? Then also, if the person say say uh, uh, the shop, if the shopkeeper said it's okay, also. So it depends. If I just want to try before buying, then it, I think it, this is not really loba. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, so let's. Uh, uh, yes, edit. Um, I just want to ask about Pana Tipata. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought it means like everything that's breathing, like something related to breath, actually not. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, there there is this explanation also, like uh, beings that um, that are uh, that breathe. The living beings. Um, this one, I have to reconfirm it again with my teachers, but sometimes I have heard uh, in the meditation center that there are yogis that ask the, uh, the teacher, he said, I just bought um, washing powder and he says it kills uh, like 90% of bacteria. And so if I use this washing powder, am I am I uh, doing panatipata? So teacher, at that time, the teacher explained that uh, bacteria are not included in those living being so that's okay for her to use the, the washing powder in that case so about whether it is only breathing i will confirm with my teacher okay all right uh, yes amar the dying uh being right uh, so basically like uh you know today like you know the a lot of like you know pet owner consider like a uh, dying pets they uh, they they took a uh, you know a suggestion from doctor to uh, end the life after like you know the last moment of the dying being that is also breaking the rule. I mean panatipata, right? All right. Yes, that is con uh, considered panatipata. According to Abhidhamma, it's quite clear, but uh, there is always debate about this because sometimes many people say compassion killing, right? So our teacher explained that actually there is no killing that is compassion compassionate, actually, because killing is killing. Although, um, be uh, because that being, uh, he, the lifespan of that being is not yet finished, actually. Sometimes, Compassion can be easily uh, mixed with dosa. 
because um, the owner, his or he or she is not capable of tolerating the suffering of the animal. So he has aversion towards the suffering of the animal. So therefore, uh, they, they decided to uh, give an injection or something to end the life so, so that they don't suffer so much anymore. No, But actually, um, this is also considered in a way panatipata. So if possible, our teachers also advise to avoid this kind of um, the actions. Is that clear, Ahmad? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. That's okay. what I, I talked also. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. For for pets also, and especially sometimes now nowadays there are some treatments for let's say uh, for elderly persons or for some family members when they are in hospital. Sometimes when they are connected to, uh, you know, the oxygens and uh, many machines to keep the body alive. Like those times, our teachers also say be very careful uh, in deciding whether to to do that. Because uh, once they are connected, sometimes there are some patients that that uh, because of the machine, they stay alive for some period of time. And then later on, if if the family decided that they should unplug those machines, then that's also like kind of panatipata. So uh, our teachers also say, be careful to make those kind of decisions. All right. Uh, okay. Sorry, but uh, yes. if the person uh, decided it itself to do it, so you don't do anything. You just, uh, for for instance, where I live is in, in illegal to do something like this. So you need to bring him overseas. So if he if he decided to do it and you only bring him, so this one is also on you, correct? Uh, you are responsible of it. The helping also, yes, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. So let's go to the third one. The third one is uh, Kamesumi Chachara, sexual misconduct. So that is not respecting one's commitment or the commitment of others, uh, as well as um, having sexual conduct with, uh, in the scripture, it is said that persons that are under protection of uh, parents, of guardians, of other, um, uh, like uh, underage uh, children and all this. So this is also included in sexual misconduct. Okay, now, these three, uh, the three uh, unwholesome physical actions, um, taking life of any living being, taking what is not being given, and sexual misconduct. Okay, so let's go to the next group, which are the four verbal. Now, the four verbal ones, it's uh, the first one, musawada, is telling lies. This is obvious, telling what is not true, no? Then, but Musawada is a little bit wider than just telling what is not true. I mean, just telling lies. Uh, minimizing or exaggerating the truth is also considered uh, Musawada. Okay, so um, then we also have Pisuna Wacha, which is slandering and divisive speech. So these ones are, are like, um, for example, let's say in the pictures, oh, don't go with this, this, this person, or like dividing other people, the dividing the harmony between other people is also one kind of um, uh, unwholesome speech. Okay, and then we have Farusa Wacha, which are harsh speech. Uh, this is easy to understand. Then we have uh, Sampa Palapa, a vain talk. Actually, this is the one that is most difficult sometimes because this one is considered unwholesome because it wastes the time of uh, another person and also it wastes the time of oneself. This is considered um, vain talk, and like joking or talking about other things that is not conducive to the... Um, uh, growth of uh, sila, samadhi, and panya, no? uh, to the growth of morality, of stability of mind, and of wisdom. So these four are uh, the four verbal unwholesome actions. Telling lies, exager exaggerating, uh, slandering or dividing people, harsh words, and vain talk. Okay, then we have three mental. Let's see. The mental one the first one is called uh, avija, 
covetousness. This is the greedy wish of uh, appropriating others' property, like wanting other other people's thing. No, like this is in the gre greedy group. No, uh, obviously. Then we also have uh, biabada ill will. Uh, those are the hateful thoughts of harming others. It's not actually doing anything, but it's just in the mind. They're thinking about uh, harmful uh, or hurtful things. Uh, okay. Then the third one is called Michaditi, wrong view, which we have already seen in the uh, when we introduced the Loba group. Now, there are a lot of different kinds of wrong views, but there are three that are most serious and most dangerous one, which is uh, considered in, uh, I mean, included in this 10 course of unwholesome action. The first one is the view of uncostedness or the randomness of existence and, of, uh, and phenomena. So th this is called in Pali, ahetukaditi, meaning that those ideas or view that there is no cause or conditions for defilements and purification of beings. Beings are defiled and purified by chance or by faith. So those kind of ideas is the first uh, dangerous wrong view, ahetukaditi. Then we have the second one is the view of the inefficacy of action, meaning that there might be cause for something to happen, but there is no effect. So akriya diti. So in this view, people think that there is no result in whatever good or bad one does. Okay. So this is the second view. And then the third view is the view of nihilism. Nihilism. So this one is called Natika Diti. So this is quite um, popular these days. YOLO, the idea of that. Uh, so in this idea, people think that death is the complete destruction of everything. There is nothing anymore after death. So enjoy whatever you wish, do whatever you want to do. So this kind of idea is also a wrong view. So in this three wrong, wrong view, if we make a little summary, actually the first one has the idea of there are no causes. And the second one, and there are no effects or no result. And the third one, no cause, no result. So these three types of uh, views are the most dangerous. Why? Why is it dangerous? Because by holding one of these wrong views, then people think that it doesn't matter, I can do whatever I want because there are no effects and then it doesn't matter and no cause and no effect. So in this case, if people have this idea, then they have no respect for morality and they can do whatever unwholesome and whatever bad bad things. No? So with this idea, a lot of Akusala can arise thinking that uh, that doesn't matter. Or I should do whatever I want to do because this is life is only once and there is nothing more after this. No. Okay, so these are the uh, Michaditi that is uh, considered the most serious and included in the 10 course of unwholesome actions. Okay, so we have three physical, uh, which is killing or taking life of other beings, taking what is not being given, sexual misconduct. And then verbal, lying, slandering, harsh speech, and vain talk. And another three, which are covetousness, ill will, and wrong view. So these 10 are considered as the 10 course of unwholesome actions. So when we perform this kind of actions, then akusala chitas arise in the mind. Now, understanding what are these unwholesome actions, why is it important to understand them? Because understand them help us direct the mind to be away from Akusala when opportunity arise for these actions. No? So when there are uh, opportunities for, for example, the other day, Claudia shared, and then she said, like, there are opportunities for saying something about another person, but because she remember, then she directed the mind of she prefer not to do so. So knowing these are not good, knowing these that are akusala help us help us to direct the mind to be away from this from these um, actions which plants akusala seeds. No, then because these are causes, then later on effects are going to happen. So these ones are important to understand them and to know them for prevention. Right? Okay. Now these ten cause of unwholesome actions can be divided into different groups. Let's see. The first one, 
killing harsh speech and ill will. And this, with these actions, what kind of cheetah do you think arise in us? What kind of cheetah? Dosa. Right, right. Killing harsh speech and ill will spring from the root of hatred from dosa, right? Okay, so how about sexual misconduct, covetousness, covetousness and wrong view? Greed. Love. Love. Uh, sorry, uh, moha. Moha and only loba, loba right? Greed. Yes. yes. Okay, yes. Sexual misconduct because of attachment, because of greed, because of liking, right? So sexual misconduct or covetousness, wanting the things of other people. And wrong view, as we explained already, is the attachment to the idea, right? So these are actually loba group. Right. Okay. Then, how about taking what is not being given, lying, slandering, and vain talk? Loba. Mm -hmm. Loba. Yeah. Loba. Okay. So actually, these four can be because of either loba or either dosa. Because mm -hmm. a person, if he takes something which is not being given because he's greedy, because he wants it, then it's loba, right? Sometimes people have very different wicked, wicked ideas. No, We think that uh, I hate this person, so I will take his things so that uh, it is because not because I want it. I just want him not to have it. Right? That's also possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that in that case, that is because of dosa. So in that case, if he has this idea, then dosa mulachita arise in him. If he takes because he wants it, then loba mulachita arise, right? So in lying, it is in the same way. So sometimes people lie because um, they because they want something, or sometimes it's because they have uh, aversion towards some other people and they want to tell something not true, right? That's also possible in the same way of slandering and vain talk. Yes, Austin. I was wondering, uh, in all of this uh, misconduct, uh, like all the basic five precepts are covered except um, not taking alcohol. And uh, I was just wondering if, how come that was not in the misconduct. Right. Okay. Now we are uh, after this section. We are going to the precepts actually in later later session today. Now to answer this question first, because taking alcohol itself is not an unwholesome action, but why is it inside the precept? Because taking alcohol um, clouds the mind. Right. So the mind, when the mind is not clear, then it is easy for the person to kill, to to lie and uh, to do sexual misconduct, to harm others, and to do vain talks, and all these other actions, which are actually akusala, can happen. Therefore, it is in the precepts, a refrain from taking alcohol, no? Because that itself is not bad, is not unwholesome, but because it easily let the mind, uh, I mean, I mean, it lets the mind lose control and do all other kinds of unwholesome actions. Therefore, it is not included in the unwholesome actions, but it is not encouraged. Right. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. So now we see that uh, killing, uh, harsh speech, and ill will uh, among these 10 cores of unwholesome action, this group is uh, surely, surely is rooted in dosa, no, in dosa mulachita, in dosa. And then this three is surely rooted in loba. And this four can be sometimes, depending on situation, can be dosa and can be loba. And now remember that uh, all these cheetahs always associate with moha, right? Yeah, because moha is a universal to all the akusala cheetahs, no? So always, with dosa as well as moha, with loa as well as moha in the same way. Okay. All right. Okay. So now uh, let's take a look at the three levels of uh, mental defilements. Now, when we say mental defilements, meaning loa, dosa, and moha, and some other chetasikas as well, other mental uh, factors as well. But these mental factors, we are going to look at them uh, in uh, chapter two. For example, like uh, uh, jealousy and all these other mental factors, which are included in the, um, in these three groups. Later, we're going to look at them in details, but now we're going to look at the three levels first. Okay. 
these three levels are actually how mental defilements are being manifested. The first one is called uh, witty karma. Those are mental defilements which are being acted out. Like we really physically do those actions or we say harsh words and we say we tell lies and or all this, no? So really physically doing it. And this level of a mental defilement is called witty karma, acting out. Then we have another level of mental defilement, which is called pariyutana. So pariyutana are those defilements that manifest or arise only in the mind. So a person is thinking about um, this akusala, thinking about this uh, loba or dosa in the mind, but he didn't do anything physically. So these defilements only arise in the mind. Okay, so this is a little bit subtle level of defilements. And we have the most subtle level of defilement, which is called the anuseya, latent. And what does that mean? Latent defilements means that the defilement actually um, is not even arisen in the in the arisen in the mind yet and of course not acting out but it has the potential to arise so that's the possibility of the arising of mental defilement so we have these um, conditions when conditions arise then these latent defilements can uh, arise in the mind as pariyutana or as witi, witi, uh, as witi kama. So as long as a person is not totally um, uh, enlightened or uh, to some degree enlightened, then this latent defilements is always uh, there. There is always potential. So we see it's like matches, no? So when conditions are there, it can arise. There are possibilities. So latent, uh, latent uh, defilements are possibilities. Okay. Now, many times when we heard uh, we have already heard that the, the Buddha's teaching is about developing sila, samadhi, and panya, no? So now let's take a look at why is it important and how does it work? Now, sila, this Pali word, is mean, it means morality. So graphically, we um, uh, say that it is like the root, like the basis for, for the tree. Yeah? So sila, then we have samadhi which is mental stability, and we have wisdom, panya. So these three level uh, of training is the, is the teaching of the Buddha, right? Okay, now let's take a look at sila first. Sila, as we see the five precepts here of um, the five precepts, actually there are two sides to it. Sometimes when we recite and we say we refrain from killing, we refrain from uh, stealing, we refrain from sexual misconduct, but actually there is a positive side to it. Not only do we refrain from killing, but as we, we, um, uh, we show loving kindness towards being as well. So not only do we not harm them, but we show loving kindness and we take care of life. So that's the positive side, side to it. And not stealing, not only that we don't take what is not being given, but we are being generous as well. So this is the other side to the, the second precept. Then the third one, not that I just don't have sexual misconduct, but I uh, respect my commitment to my partner. So this is the positive side to the precept as well. And then not saying harsh speech or not uh, telling lies or slandering or, uh, or doing vain talk. Instead of that, not only that, but we do, we use kind words. Uh, we try to encourage others. Like using the words wisely is also the other side of the precept. And the not taking of um, alcohol, in this case, not just that we don't try to um, cloud the mind, but we try to practice, we try to make the mind more clear. And by practicing meditation and by um, studying the Dhamma, this is also the other side of the, of the precept. So this sila, this morality is a base, is a basis, is a basis for the all the other practice. And why is it important? Because sila keep us away from the manifestation of vita, uh, vit, viti kama. If we keep the precepts, then we uh, protect the mind from 
uh, acting out, uh, I mean, from doing unwholesome actions, no, from acting out, actually, from doing it. Because we, if we don't kill, uh, we keep the precept, then we will not kill, we will not steal, we will not do all these things, which are in the level of Vitikama. So Sila helps to protect us from this level of mental defilement. Now, how about the next level, Samadhi? Samadhi is mental stability, right? So mental stability helps us in the uh, to prevent the next level of mental defilement, which is pariyutana, those that arise in, only in the mind. Because if we keep the mind uh, stable, concentrated, and uh, thinking about the Husala way and thinking about the Dhamma, then the mental defilements uh, have less chance to arise. Okay, so how to do this? So this is being done by um, samatha meditation, no? So cultivating samadhi, um, uh, cultivating uh, mental stability. So this one uh, is the next level of prevention for this level of um, mental defilements. Now, wisdom is the most powerful one. Wisdom is the only one that can totally get rid of the potentiality of the arising of defilements. So, and Panya is cultivated by practicing Vipassana meditation. Okay, so therefore, the three levels, Sila, Samadhi, and Panya, directly help us to uh, counter counteract with the three levels of the de mental defilements. So therefore, it is important uh, to, to practice all these three. Sila help us with uh, acting out uh, the most gross level of mental defilement, the manifestation of the most grossest level. Samadhi helps us to protect us from the defilements that arise only in the mind. And Panya help us with uh, the, um, to get rid of the the, the latent tendency of mental defilements. Okay, so as we all know, there are two types of mental, um, I mean, two types of mental training, the samatha and vipassana meditation. For uh, samadhi, uh, for mental stability, we need to practice samatha. And for panya to arise, we need to practice vipassana meditation. Okay, so... Up to here, we have, uh, oh, yes, Claudia. Um, well, if I, if I never, for example, practice meditation, with your explanation, I would say, why, don't, why we practice Samadhi? We could practice the, the straight away Vipassana because Vipassana is like, uh, basically is developing both wisdom and mental stability why people practice samadhi mm -hmm. well now there are different kinds of samadhi as well this is another topic that we have to go into uh, in later chapters now samadhi uh, let's say let's not talk about jhana first if we talk about jhana this is a uh, very highly developed samadhi right so let's say in our daily practice of course we can directly practice um vipassana but for vipassana samadhi is also necessary so without the ability of mind the mind is not capable of understanding reality as it is so it is necessary to practice samadhi for mental stability, but it does not always have to uh, come from, uh, let's say, a traditional samatha meditation, let's say. So we don't, uh, I mean, it is very helpful if we concentrate at something, at the breath or at some uh, specific object, then the mind is easier to calm down. Calm down. Then the, when the mind is stable, then the mind is more powerful to develop wisdom, to see things as they really are. So samadhi or samatha meditation is definitely helpful, a good uh, tool uh, to help the mind calm for panya to arise. So some people, they practice samatha meditation to a certain degree. When the mind is calm, then they switch to vipassana. Uh, to try to understand reality as they really as it really is, no. Then sometimes, uh, yes. But this one is in the you mean like um, during a period of time or in the same session? It depends on the person. 
if if he thinks that uh, 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 this is really personal to the person, if he thinks that every section, then he try to practice samadhi, and then he when he thinks that the mind is uh, now calm enough then he can switch to vipassana immediately. Some people doesn't do uh, with a specific object, but they do uh, vipassana directly. If they think their mind is strong enough, then they can directly observe. And by observing those uh, different objects, the mind can also calm down if the mind is uh, strong enough. That's also okay. So it, it, it really depends on different people. Then some people say that in a retreat, they practice three days of samadhi. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, samatha meditation to really calm the mind. Then on the fourth day, then they change to uh, vipassana. That's also possible. So this is different way of practice depending on the liking or the necessity of even the same person in different period of time. Right? Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, there is another point that I just want to mention. Later on, we can explore this. Then samadhi uh, is not synonym with samatha. Okay, so sometimes samatha uh, um, means, uh, um, I mean, samadhi can be developed uh, in diff into different degree. And, uh, it can go to up to jhana, but it can also go into a very, very high degree, almost jhana, but can be used for vipassana meditation as well. So this topic, we'll, let's talk about it in another day. But I just want to say samadhi is necessary even for vipassana meditation. Okay, because you see, it is uh, one of the noble eightfold path, no? Sama samadhi, that's... Uh, that is surely for uh, vipassana. It is samadhi is also necessary. Okay, we can take a break here for five minutes, and then because coming back, then we will switch to kusala uh, to um, hold some actions. Okay, so let's take a five minutes break here, and I'll see you again in five minutes. Okay, welcome back, everyone. So we have just finished with the 10 course of unwholesome action. And now coming, we are going to look at the 10 basis of meritorious action. So the opposite no, of the other of the other 10. Now, last week, we have seen when we talked about the Kusala Chitas, we have seen a few meaning of uh, Kusala. No? The first one is the healthy of, or absence of disease. The second one is blameless or faultless. So those actions are not blamed by noble people. And the third one is that Kusala is productive of happy result or productive of desirable results. So these are the meaning of Kusala that we have seen last time. And there is actually some other meaning according to uh, etymology. Now we are going to look at one of them today. Now, if we divide the word Kusala into Ku and Sala, uh, Ku can mean uh, this, uh, despicable or contemptible, uh, coming from the word kuchita, which is uh, equal to akusala. And then sala means shaking or destroying. So in this case, kusala can also mean those mental states that shake or destroy the despicable mental states. Um, those mental states that do this are called kusala. OK, so this is another meaning of Kusala. So let's take a look at um, the 10 causes of, uh, uh, I mean, the 10 meritorious deeds. And before that, uh, right now we have been talking about uh, Sila, Samadhi and Panya. No? Then there is one more thing to add to uh, this three level of training, actually. Now, each time the, when the Buddha delivered a discourse to an audience that had never heard his teaching before, he always begins by emphasizing the value of dana. Only when after his audience had come to appreciate this virtue, would he introduce the other aspect of the teaching, which is sila, samadhi, and panya. No? So dana, generosity, actually serves as a foundation and preparation that underlies and silently support all the effort uh, for the mind to be free from impurities or defilements. No? So dana, we can say that if this, if sila is the root, samadhi is the trunk, and wisdom is the fruit, then dana, generosity, is the soil. So we have also, many times we also listen to this, uh, dana, sila, and bhavana, no? So bhavana here uh, means samadhi and panya. 
Bhavanadi is a Pali word means cultivation. So we have generosity, morality, and cultivation because they are all connected. So the practice of making the mind more beautiful and freer is strengthened, um, which strengthens the basis for morality and cultivation is actually dana. And then sila is also actually a part of generosity. Later we will look uh, look at it. So in the 10th basis of meritorious action, the punya kriya watu, actually the first one starts with dana. Now the practice of generosity helps us to overcome self-centeredness, which is the root of the majority of all our problems. No? And this quality of generosity is the antidote to greed and stinginess, which enslave us to our own attachment. So when one is being uh, generous, then it gives us a simple joy, which is um, uh, which is the relief, uh, actually, of taking a break from being very wrapped up in oneself or being caught up in one's own desire. No? So by practicing generosity, uh, is the most basic form of experienced a certain type of freedom. So therefore, the generosity is the basics uh, is the basis for the mind to be uh, to be calm and to be uh, happy for further development for sila samadhi and panya. Okay, now for some inspiration of uh, dana of generosity, let's take a little trip to mema. I don't know if you have been to mema before. Uh, but uh, let's let's take a little look. So the, our first stop in Myanmar here, maybe I, I think you know where it is, right? So this is Thailand, Vietnam, Laos. This is China, Bangladesh. So Myanmar is around here. And then our first stop in Myanmar, let's go to Yangon. Okay, so in Yangon, uh, there is um, this uh, meditation center, this uh, is the place where I practice meditation. It is called the Shweyumin Damasuka Forest Center. So it is uh, situated in the outskirts of Yangon in a small, uh, in a let's say a village area. And people in, in the area, they are not very rich, but they are actually very generous. So every morning, the monks, they will go out for arms round. And you will see elders and also bringing little children. Then they will uh, offer um, uh, food, well, most of the time rice, uh, to all the monks. And this is my teacher, Seado Tejaniya. So in the morning, arms round, uh, people will offer lunch uh, with great respect, actually. But you can see their houses, they are not very wealthy, but um, they uh, do this offering every day. There's a little video. So you see in the village, uh, every morning when the monks come out to arms round and people are waiting there and offering lunch to uh, all the monks from the monastery. And they offer so much that all the monks actually have to empty their bowl a few times into this cart. Uh, and uh, the whole meditation center, actually everyone take um, um, the rice that are collected by the monks um, every day in the meditation center. So this is just for some inspiration. And then, so that's Yangon. And then let's go to uh, Mandalay. That's a city in the north, uh, in the more in the north. And there is this very old temple, which is called Shui Jin Tai Maji. This uh, temple is actually offered by King Ming Dong, um, the last king uh, in, in Myanmar. And um, uh, this is still, uh, uh, old monastery which is still working right now so our teacher um uh elder let's, let's say his dhamma elder brother uh, is the abbot of this monastery so sometimes we visit there as well now in Myanmar, in some uh it, there is a very beautiful practice that um people take special occasions as opportunity to perform good actions. For example, this photo is uh, well, while we are there, there was a wedding. So this couple actually start their new life together by doing kusala together. So they offer lunch uh, in the monastery to all the uh, monks and samaneras. So uh, this is a way like uh, sometimes uh, we in modern days here, we, we expect that in our wedding that we get gifts no? or in our birthday, 
we are the one to receive, right? But in Myanmar, they take this as an opportunity that this is my special day. This is my day for me to do kusala, then they give instead of expecting to receive something. So that's also very beautiful. And in another celebration, um, there is a very a young nun that she, to celebrate her graduation, uh, she actually uh, graduated as a Dhamma teacher. There is this uh, Dhamma Charya examination in Myanmar. So she passed the exam. And then so she offered lunch and requisites to actually more than 100 people, including monks and nuns and lay people. So they... Uh, so this is the way how they celebrate. So I think this is um, uh, also very beautiful. And then another thing which is very nice is the way to honor and support elderly or parents and grandparents is actually to help them practice generosity. So you see this elder lady here. So her family uh, brought her to the monastery uh, for her to offer lunch. So um, this is like offering opportunity for the elders to do good because when they do good, then they have kusala chittas arise in their mind. No? So therefore, uh, to, to there is no better way to honor or to support the elderly than giving them opportunity to generate more kusala chittas in them. So good result is going to happen no? So uh, for them. So this is also very beautiful. And... Besides our teachers also, besides giving Dhamma dana, besides sharing Dhamma, they also practice all other kinds of dana. Uh, so that time uh, when we were there, our teacher, uh, they also, uh, when they, when some other uh, lay people or or students, uh, when, offer, when they offer donations to our teachers, then they don't use it for themselves. As a monk, they don't need that much. So sometimes they use those donations to contribute to people that for example here our teacher they, he is offering to an orphanage and then uh, there was a flood uh, sometimes um, there are uh, earthquakes and floods and everything uh, disasters and so they were building uh, this um, with water tank because the water system is not so good. So people doesn't have clean drinking water. So this is another project that they are building this uh, water tank for drinking water in different villages. And as well, Seadoji uh, Unandamala uh, Biwamsa, he actually built a whole hospital uh, with the donations that he collected, as well as uh, all the nurses and doctors and all the staff uh, in the uh, in where that works in this hospital is supported by his dana actually. Okay, so that's just some inspiration of uh, how people practice uh, dana in Myanmar. And uh, now we would like to also take a look at some points which influence the quality of our act of giving and the results. Uh, previously, we have talked a little bit about it, and today we have some more information to share with you. So, the way we give. Uh, influence uh, the result uh, that, that um, comes with it. For example, giving with due respect or giving without respect is one point. And another point is giving with the knowledge of cause and effect and without such knowledge. So that makes a difference. And then giving with joy or without joy in the three times, meaning before giving, during giving and after giving that also affects um, the quality of the giving. Um, so this, this three times is actually uh, quite nice. So for example, before giving, then the person is thinking uh, she, she or he is happy about, oh, I'm going to do this offering or I'm going to give uh, help my mom or I'm going to give this uh, gift for my friend. So it's happy about it before doing it. And while doing it, it's also doing it with joy. And after doing it, then she or she also thinks that it's so nice that uh, of what I did. Um, so this, if we are happy with joy in these three times, then that is uh, of very good quality. This giving is of very good quality. Then the next point is whether it is prompted or unprompted, uh, as we have seen in the cheetahs, and with aspiration for worldly uh, pleasure as a result, and with aspiration for wisdom as a result, it also make a difference. So when we give something, then sometimes people give, uh, uh, oops, people make an aspiration, no? Of like, may this merit be um, a condition for wisdom to arise or if the person has aspiration for worldly 
pleasure or uh, may I be rich because of this uh, good act, no, or something like that. So this also affects uh, and influences the quality. Yes, Edith. So I just, I just need a little clarification on the first one. Like it seems like the most important um, mm -hmm. with due respect and without due respect. What does that mean? Uh -huh. I mean this yeah, just simply when we when we offer something, we can offer it respectfully, or we can just uh, oh, I just give you no, like you know, like uh, sometimes um uh it. In an easy example, if uh, even like this, just even small giving, even if we are feeding our pet, this is also an offering. This is also a, a, a good action. So if I feed the dog, uh, I just throw the food wherever. And then that's without respect. Not that I have to, you know, you understand not that the dog is very respectable, but you do the action respectfully or like you place it very nicely and like like this in 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 a simple way uh this is one example uh or we just throw so, it there so that's one example and another way is for our teacher for example uh, or for other people like elders so if we do it respectfully or if we just you know just do it without that kind of um that's so that, that's my question, um, Tirana. Is it uh, like uh, you have to respect the person or is it like what you're saying, like um, not throwing it, but just offering it very nicely or something? Uh -huh. Now, OK, so there are uh, two aspects here, Re doing the action respectfully and respecting the person, right? So there are two, two aspects here. So firstly, if the person is respectable, like he is a, um, a person, like uh, uh, parents, for example. So we respect our parents and we do the action respectfully. That's, that's very good, right? So there are some times that we have to offer something to a person that we don't really respect because of his action or because his morality is not good or something. So I don't really actually agree with this person, but I still offer something. Well, that's okay. You don't have to respect that person, but you do the action still respectfully. Not that because I don't respect him, I throw it to him or something, no? Or... Or so so here let's let's say we give it with due respect first first but of course with respect to the person if the person is respectable then it's even better. Now we are coming to uh, this point uh, in the next slide, but uh, we, let's see Austin's question first, and then we will go there a little bit more about respect. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to check on the fifth point uh, only two options are there with aspiration for worldly pleasure or with aspiration for wisdom as a result but it is not possible sorry sorry uh, i i your uh i can't listen very well the volume is a little bit like uh soft can you please repeat hello yes yeah uh, in the fifth point there is fifth. with aspiration for worldly or with aspiration for wisdom I was wondering, uh, is those only options? I mean, it can be with without any aspiration for either of those two, right? That's also an option. Like uh, no aspiration. Yeah, that's also possible. Yes, that's also possible. But remember, last week we explored a little bit that uh, how um, cheetahs associated with wisdom arise more frequently, remember? So when we do good actions with the aspiration of uh, for wisdom to arise, then later on, because of this, uh, the mind directing the mind to that direction, then later on, with uh, cheetahs, kusala cheetahs with wisdom can arise more frequently. So, so that's uh, for, for that, uh, it is good to have an aspiration for wisdom to arise as well. But some people do wish something like, may I do this? I do this good, maybe, uh, may this uh, good action. Uh, by this good action, may I become rich in my next life or something. No, some people also wish for worldly stuff also. Then some people doesn't think about anything also. That's possible also. Thank you. Yes, welcome. Okay, anyone else? No? Okay, so let's continue now. Okay, so let's see some more points that affect the quality. Now, here is the morality of the donor and the recipient. 
with, with the person who received the donation. So if the person uh, that donates has good morality and the person who received the, the gift uh, also has good morality, then the quality of this uh, action is much better than, than the, if the donor or if the person to receive has uh, not so good morality. No? So this is also a, a point. And then, uh, okay, the next point is offering done with, with one's own hand and offering made by sending another person. Because we can also uh, offer something, but we ask someone to do it or, or we do it by ourselves, no? Now, this different also, uh, it, it's a little bit different also because imagine thinking like if I'm going to offer something to someone and then I do it by myself, offering him. So actually, the duration of that is longer, right? It's longer than I just make a phone call, please give this to some, some, some person or please offer for me this, some, this thing, no? So that's a uh, like maybe two minutes phone call. But if I do it myself, maybe it's like 10 minutes or if I go to offer lunch in the monastery, it might take a whole morning, right? So the time, the duration for Kusala Chitta to arise is actually longer if we do calculation, no? So there are more Kusala Chittas, more Kusala Chittas arising during this action when we do it by ourselves. So even just by numbers, then we see then the quality is different. There are more kusala chittas that can arise, right? Okay. Now, and a constant offering or an occasional offering also make a difference. Like if well, from time to time I do just some generosity, then that's also good. But if I constantly always support support, then then that's also a different uh, uh, point that influence the quality. Okay, now the offering of prime and excellent things and donation of inferior and leftover things also. This also depends because sometimes uh, we give something to someone because I don't want it anymore or because it's leftover. Sometimes it happens. Or something we offer something that is of good quality or excellent quality. You know? I'll tell you just an example which is very inspiring. One time uh, we were in Myanmar and uh, we were visiting uh, one monastery and um, that monastery is a very well, there is a building that is very amazing very beautiful and um, because the monastery it's only monks right so as a late as a uh, female i cannot stay in the monastery actually at that time so um so our teacher um arranged for a person to uh, for me to stay in the person's home very close to the monastery because we were staying for the, uh, there for a few days to visit so I went with this lady and her family then and we stayed I and another uh, another friend so we stayed in the lady's home and then later on we found out that the lady is actually the donor of uh, that very nice beating of the monastery but then I'm I, what I wanted to tell you is that the monastery, the, that building that she offered, it's so much more beautiful than her own home. So you like like uh, because we stayed in her house now, so her house is really simple, and then we actually sleep on a, a bed without cushion. So it's like hardwood, and then the, with just one bed sheet on 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 top of that of course she's not poor but then her house is really simple but compare in comparison with the building that she offered in the monastery it's really like admirable so she offered like really excellent things or things that are better than the things that she that she used herself no? all right so this is just another incident that um that we get very inspired in Myanmar. Uh, of their sada, no, of their faith and trust, and also of their generosity. Okay, now another uh, things that um, make a difference is the whether the donation is for mat of material things, or whether it is the offering of uh, freedom from fear by upholding and promoting the precepts. Now this one needs a little bit more explanation. Now we say the sila, the morality, keeping morality is actually also a gift. Why do we say so? Because the first one, panati pata, they're not killing living beings. Then if uh, the animals or if beings know that when we are around, they are safe, we are not going to harm them, then they are free from, uh, uh, free from fear. They are not afraid 
right? So we are offering this kind of assurance to beings that around me, you are safe. I'm not going to harm you. So this is also a gift. Uh, it is also very beautiful. Sometimes uh, ago, we were in a monastery. And then in this monastery, that teacher, he practiced uh, uh, and he teaches metta. So the environment there have this like, very nice uh, atmosphere of loving kindness. And I really have to tell you that there are lots of birds and cats and dogs and all the animals can feel that energy. They are all around. And the cat is playing with the dog. Uh, well, sometimes in uh, in in Western countries or in the uh, pets with the pets, sometimes cats do play with dogs. But in Myanmar, uh, in like like the street cat or street dog, you really don't see them playing together usually. So usually the dog or the cat they chase each other. No, so but in that monastery, like you can feel like uh, all beings are in harmony. So is that kind of uh, offering the the freedom? Uh, from fear to other beings, no? So this is also very beautiful. This is also a kind of donation of offering, no? By upholding and promoting the precepts. Okay, so this is also another kind of offering and also the offering of the truth of giving Dhamma Dana, no? So this is the highest no? also. All right, so now we see that, uh, that that's the first one, uh, Dana, donation uh, or generosity is the first um basis for of, uh, more merit, um, meritorious action. Now, the second one is sila itself. Now, I think we are all familiar with the five precepts, but then sometimes in Upo Day, in the new moon or full moon, then many practitioners uh, also, they take the opportunity to practice a little bit more than usual. So sometimes uh, we will take the eight precepts or training for that day. And for those who are not very familiar with it, uh, we can uh, we'll introduce a little bit what is the difference between the five precepts and the eight precepts or eight training. Now, we have seen already protecting lives, being generous, respecting one's relationship and uh, saying kind words and uh, having the mind clear and directing the mind to developing of more wisdom. This is the training, right? The five precepts. Now, for the eight precepts, this one, the uh, respecting one's relationship for that day or for the time that the person decides to take this uh, eight precept is actually changed to celibacy, uh, celibacy for that day or for that period of time. So this is for the mind to concentrate more on the on the training or on the uh, practice and study, you know. And another additional, um, so this five, uh, this other, these other ones does not change. So five of them plus. Uh, other three and one of them is taking uh, food in the right time so it means that actually before noon so the the, the day when people take uh, the eight precepts and the, they have early breakfast then before noon they finish all the meals and then afternoon uh, they do not eat until the next morning so why do we do so that's because um that we want to keep the mind uh more concentrated or more time, you know, preparing dinner or preparing like, uh, or, or if you cook, then you know that it takes a lot of time. Uh, maybe you, we take like an hour to cook and 10 minutes to eat and another hour to clean up and all the preparation and all the thinking, all the energy that goes into eating. So for that day, then uh, we practice uh, uh, having more free time also. And as well as in the Samyutta Nikaya, actually, there is also, uh, the Buddha also say that those who always dwell in mindfulness, knowing moderation in eating, their discomfort diminishes, age, uh, aging gently, life for them is long. So this is also a good practice. Recently, maybe you have all um, heard about the intermediate uh, fasting, you know, <laughs> Uh, intermittent fasting, right? So uh, this actually has been practiced uh, for thousands of years. All the monks, they all, all the time they eat until noon and then they don't eat until the next day. And it's actually healthy. While we are staying in the monasteries or meditation center in Myanmar, uh, all the yogis and all the practitioners uh, keep this precept. All right, so that's uh, one uh, of the uh, Egg precepts, and then another one is not to use a high um, or very luxurious bed or seat. 
So why is that so? Because when we are too comfortable, then we stay in bed. No, <laughs> then then we are. So to avoid that, uh, to make the mind more clear, that to wake up early and to practice. So that this this is also another precepts that we take during that day, not to use very luxurious um, seats and bed. And another one is uh, to dedicate to the Dhamma study and meditation practice one refrain from entertainment, uh, movie, music, and dance, and uh, or and bodily decoration. Because in the practice, we want to see reality as it really is. No, so we refrain from decorating <laughs> uh, or making, um, uh, doing makeups and all, all these decorations. And we want to see. Uh, the truth, how really, how things are and dedicate the mind to the practice. So these are the eight training precepts for Uposata Day. So the usual uh, respecting and um, cherishing life, generosity, celibacy, um, kind words, and this is uh, not taking alcohol and um, and any kind of um, intoxicants which uh, cloud the mind. And then we have... Uh, eating until lunch in the right time, then uh, not using a luxurious bed or seat, and as well as um, uh, not the refraining from entertainment. Now, there is also one other training, which is the ninth, uh, uh, the Nawanga Uposata Sila. Sometimes you might have heard about it. There is a ninth training. Uh, this is not actually a precept, but that is to keep the mind with uh, loving kindness towards all being. So this is also one that uh, uh, one can take an extra training during the Uposata day. Okay, so that's about um, the precepts. So we have covered um, the first two, Dana and Sila. Okay, so dana and sila support the cultivation of bhavana, of samadhi and panya. So now the third one, the third basis of meritorious action is actually bhavana itself, cultivation. The cultivation of mental stability, concentration, and the cultivation of wisdom, panya, by, by means of uh, samadhi and uh, panya, medita samatha meditation, and uh, vipassana meditation. So... Uh, samadha, uh, samatha meditation as well as vipassana meditation is also included in the meritorious action. So this is the third one, bhavana. Now the fourth one is apachayana. So paying respect to elders and people with good morality and wisdom. So this is uh, the fourth meritorious action. Then you will see that uh, 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 in this photo, Seado Nandamala Biwamsa, this is um, some students like, paying respect to Seado, but you can see Seado himself also pay respect to elders. So, so, so this is um, um, the other meritorious deeds. And in many cultures, especially in Asian cultures, in India or in Thailand, then you will see it is actually quite a uh, traditional practice to pay respect to elders and say this young little girl uh, from Thailand probably and say when her mom drop her at school and then they pay respect and, and uh, say goodbye to mom okay so and then the next one is called Weyawacha Weyawacha is service in wholesome deeds so doing good deeds like uh, um, doing some service uh, helping elderly or even just picking rubbish in in the public area or planting some trees like helping to clean the monastery or paint or do any kind of this wholesome service is also meritorious and when we do this uh, thing these actions happily then um kusala chitta arises in the mind no okay then the next one is patidana. Patidana means sharing merit. So this is like when we do something good ourselves and we share merit with all beings. Like every time when we finish um, sharing the Dhamma, when we finish the, studying the Dhamma, then we always say, Idam no punyam sabasatanam no? We share these merits with all beings. May they rejoice and be happy wherever they are. No? So this is also a uh, uh, wholesome action. Now, the seventh is patanumodana, means rejoicing, re <clears throat> rejoicing in others' merit. Uh, 
Now, the last one is when we do good, we share merits with others. Now, this one is when we see other people doing good and doing meritorious action, we say sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So this is rejoicing in other people's merit. Now, so this is also very beautiful and also a kusala action. Okay, then the next one is called Dhamma Sawana. So this is listening to the Dhamma. So this is uh, listening to the Dhamma and trying to uh, learn and practice. It's also uh, Kusala. And on the other hand, sharing the Dhamma, Dhamma Desana, is also, um, it's also uh, a meritorious action. So these two. Then we have the, the tenth which is called Diti Jukama, straightening one's right view. Now, that's the opposite to the wrong view. You know? then today we have seen some kinds of uh, wrong view, uh, like uh, thinking that there is no cause, thinking that there is no result, thinking that there is no cause and uh, effect both, and those kind of wrong view. So straightening one's right view is also a um, uh, meritorious action and uh, actually the deepest level of uh, right view is attained by the cultivation of wisdom so only until then will our view always be right no? only until the sort of actually actually um, sort of, uh, until one become a uh, sotapanna the first level of um, uh, enlightenment the first level until there then one really have a uh, uh, right view all the time Okay, so as a summary, the 10 bases of meritorious actions are uh, dana, being generous, sila, practicing morality, upholding the five or the eight precepts. Then we have bhavana, cultivating the mind with stability, concentration, and wisdom. Then we have apachayana, uh, revering people with good morality and wisdom. Vayavacha, serving others by wholesome actions or altruistic acts. We have Patidana, sharing the merits of our good deeds. Patanumodana, rejoicing in the good deeds of others. Dhamma Sawana, listening to the Dhamma. Dhamma Desana, sharing the Dhamma. And Diti Jukama, strengthening and straightening one's right view. So these 10 <coughs> are the basis of man meritorious action. Okay. So up to here, we have seen the what what does it mean by the unwholesome action practically, the 10 course of um, unwholesome actions, and then as well as the 10 basis of meritorious action. So knowing this is important because once we have this idea in the mind, then whenever chances arise uh, for Ahusala, then let's say there are conditions for us to do unwholesome deeds, then we can refrain from it. Then when then as well as we can direct the mind when there are opportunities for doing good, then we take the opportunity for more kusala chittas to arise. So this is important to know both of them. Okay, so today, uh, that's all for today. For, the, uh, for we just wanted to see what is uh, wholesome and what is unwholesome in terms of practice. And then uh, you, if, we have, if you have any questions, then we can look at a little bit of your questions. And if not, we can also finish early today. And uh, for next week, we are going to go into another group of chitta, which are the Rupa Vachara chitas. Those are the uh, chitas with characteristic of the fine material realm. Curiosity question. Um, I I just wanted to ask um, how many precepts did you have to keep uh, when you were a nun? Uh, when I was a nun, uh, that uh, in Myanmar uh, we keep the eight precepts, and then uh, sometimes we keep. Well, it depends personally. Uh, sometimes some people keep nine precepts, and some nuns in Myanmar keep ten precepts. Also, the tenth precept is like the Samanera um, uh, practice. Uh, that one is they do not uh, handle money. Also, so mm -hmm. some of them because in Myanmar sometimes uh, it it is uh, uh, it is not so easy if the nunnery if they have lay people to support them 
then they can keep this preset more easily if the some people can help them to buy food or to do something. But sometimes if situation does not allow them to do so, then they have to handle money and handle the donations and to buy food for the monastery. And so it depends on the nuns, uh, how many precepts they take. But also another thing is that um, uh, we have to understand, although the monks, they have 200 uh, some uh, precepts that they have to keep many of them are uh, the, um, actually I would say the most important ones are the are the same ones are the um, are the not killing not stealing and um, celibacy and all this actually the main the most important ones are the same there are many others that are uh, minor but still they, they, those are precepts for example the monks have also uh, let's say um, uh they, they cannot um, whistle while walking, for example. That is one precept, <laughs> the, <laughs> one of the 200-something. So why is that so? Because uh, this is an actually interesting information. Did you know that the Buddha never never um, prescribed um, a precept just because uh, uh, he wanted to subscribe? Uh, I mean prescribe a precept. It's always whenever there is a situation that happens, uh, during the time of the Buddha, then when some situation happened, then somebody can, uh, in the very beginning, there is no precept at all. I mean, of course, the, yeah. the very, the very uh, no killing and those uh, moralities, because people uh, have good morality already at that time. But then later on, uh, then things, start, when the Sangha gets bigger, then also, then there are non-enlightened beings, uh, non-enlightened monks as well, so there are some things start to happen. Then when something happened, then someone will come, oh, the Buddha uh, in this, this, this monastery, this village, and this happened, and then the Say, for example, one monk, he was whistling while he going to arms round and he was walking. And then so this is not not, uh, not uh, in the Indian society at that time. That is not very acceptable culturally, you know, and it doesn't look very, very nice. So the Buddha then said, <clears throat> because of this incident, some people, um, some people um, uh, complained. And then so the Buddha, then he said, OK, then from now on, all the monks, uh, uh, should not whistle while they uh, go arms around while, while they are walking in the street, right? So always something happened, then the Buddha said, okay, so now from now on, uh, let's do it this way, right? So he never really uh, make up something. So it's always when something happened. So, um, and the precepts, uh, these precepts, which are more um, uh, concerning the the behavior of the monks let's say when they go out there the ropes say how how they have to uh, dress up and all these things the buddha give precepts always always to protect the dhamma and the sangha not because he wants to give a difficult time to the monks that you should not do this you should not do that you should not do that not not because of that that's because the buddha wants to protect he wants everyone to respect the dhamma as the dhamma should uh, be respected because otherwise, if the monks do not behave uh, like behave in a certain way, then when other people uh, see that, then they will think that, oh, this training does not worth anything. Like you see these monks, they are be behaving like that. So the Buddha wanted to protect the, the teaching and protect the Sangha. Therefore, all this, uh, uh, a lot of minor rules are also uh, being established. Well, what I going back to the main point is that uh, for the nuns, even with they don't have the two hundred some some uh, uh, precepts this day. Well, actually, in the time of the Buddha, the nuns they have even more precepts than the monks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, because of you know, like the lineage and all this um, uh, thing, so nowadays in Myanmar, the nuns usually keep eight, uh, nine, or sometimes ten precepts. But then, of course, uh, all this is about the mind. No, if one wants to keep all this precept, no one, no one uh, uh, stop us from doing so. So, if we want to keep two hundred something, that's also okay. Um, I also have a question about um, there was a uh, about lying. I was a little bit surprised that it, uh, you wrote that even exaggeration is uh, considered as lying and i was wondering where um um for example like bragging falls under um bragging uh, meaning like uh like saying that i'm like this like this and i'm this good and that good 
Yes. Now, if it is true, if what he say is true about himself, then that's not lying. But mm -hmm. maybe, but maybe there is with pride. So maybe some uh, akusala chita can arise, but he's not breaking the precept because what he said is not is true. Uh, what he's saying mm -hmm. is not. If I am not, uh, if what I'm saying bragging is is false. For example, I'm only a primary graduated, and I say I have a doctor degree and this and that and like that. So if that is not true, then that's also lying as well as some other agusalachitas for pride and also for all other things that can arise because of the situation. No? Mm -hmm. To ask you your um, um, your experience with the training in ordain as a nun and uh, um, then uh, why you didn't ordain. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I was thinking it was not possible to do that. Uh, yes, it is possible. Uh, in in Myanmar, uh, it is possible to ordain the Asanand temporarily or um, or for for um, a long period of time. No, it really depends on on everyone. Uh, I think it is uh, what there is one different in the Theravada tradition and the Mahayana tradition. And I um I'm not sure how how is it in Thailand. Maybe you have better idea. Um, so there are places where temporary ordination is not allowed. But in Myanmar, where I practice, it is allowed. Uh, and I think it is very nice because uh, many people in Myanmar, lay people, when they have a holiday, a long holiday, then they want to practice more <clears throat> intensively. Then they take the ropes for that period of time. Maybe they have family, they have work. and But only during this holiday, they want to practice uh, more intensively. So for, let's say, one month, then they go to the monastery. If during that month, they ordain as a monk or as a nun, and they take all the precepts and practice very diligently during that time. And when their holiday is finished, they must have they have their responsibility of the family or of work, then they uh, disrupt, and then they go back to work. Um, so, so you shave uh, and everything, correct? I, uh, well, I'm talking in general right now, yes? For in general, so for myself, yes, for myself, mm -hmm. I did. Uh, I um I take training as a nun, uh, for twice uh, when I was in Myanmar in different years, uh, for the practice during the time when I was in Myanmar, uh, the um, yeah, the first time it was two thousand and four, and then the, then later on another year two thousand and eight, I think uh, also another time. Yes, I did. I shaved and I had the ropes and uh, and I practiced as the nun uh, during that period of time, and uh, then later on. Um, I think this is also very uh, mm -hmm. person to person. Some people feel very comfortable as uh, as monastic, and some person feel more comfortable as a lay person. But in the monastery, in the meditation center, the practice is the same. So everyone, a monk or a nun or a lay person, everybody keeps the minimum, the eight precepts, and then uh, our practice is to keep mindful and do the practice, uh, meditate, and report to the teacher, and then the teacher will give guidance. So those are the life in the monastery or in the meditation center, no? So, um, yeah, so I did practice as a lay person as well, and sometime in a monastery, and sometimes I practiced as a, uh, as a nun as well. And then later on, uh, personally, I find uh, comfortable practicing as a lay person as well, mm -hmm. where anyway, the precepts is the same and practice is the same. Of course, of course, it is a very, very good experience. Uh, if you have chance, I do encourage you to try, because the, the first time when I shave the head, then I realize how much attachment I have to my hair. That's, yeah. <laughs> if you don't shave, you don't know. <laughs> they said, no, I, uh, it doesn't matter. I can cut it short, whatever. No, but when you shave, then you know. Uh, so, so it's a good experience also. And then you will see like uh, dressing, wearing the robes and the robes does have a power, actually, I would say than energy. So when you are, uh, shaved and in the ropes then it it kind of is an, a little push of encouragement of the practice as well so uh, you behave a little bit um more no, i will not say seriously but but the thing encourages you in the practice so it is also good 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 to try if you have chance yeah i have shaved once because i took some uh i don't remember the name in english 
privilege of this animal from dogs. Mm. I was oh, in uh, okay, okay. I was yeah, in, yeah. in Asia, so I had to bother not for mm. monastic reasons, but yeah, <laughs> definitely it affects you. Yes, it does. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. Welcome, welcome. Thanks. Welcome. Right? Okay. So thank you everyone for your effort and let's um, dedicate um, our merits um, uh, with aspiration for more wisdom to arise later on. And then we also share merits with all beings. Okay. Itam no punyam nibanasa pacheyo hotu. Itam no punyam nibanasa pacheyo hotu. Itam no punyam nibanasa pacheyo hotu. May this wholesome action of studying the Dhamma be conditions for the attainment of Nibbana. Itam no punyam sabasatanam pajima. Itam no punyam sabasatanam pajima. Itam no punyam sabasatanam pajima. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We share sadhu, the sadhu, with sadhu. all beings. Sad, sad, sad. Sad, sad, sad. Okay, so thank you everyone for attending uh, today's class. I'm very happy to see you all and to share with you. Uh, okay, so we'll see you on the 15th. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. See thank you. you so much. Thank you.